Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar titled Pause and the Law, Navigating Pet Ownership in Singapore. This webinar is organized by Pro Bono SG. My name is Johannes and I'll be your host and moderator for tonight. Now you see from the screen that I'm a practicing lawyer and that I will be joined tonight by two other lawyers. So um, I have no choice but to begin by doing what lawyers love to do which is to give a disclaimer, or should I say a cat yet? <laughs> no part of tonight's conversation is intended or should be construed as a substitute for professional legal advice. We're just talking generally here. So if you have a specific question or a specific legal issue that you need help with, I strongly suggest you seek legal advice. There will be a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you would like to participate and give some questions to our speakers. Uh, you can go online to the website pigeonhole.at and submit your questions there. The passcode is Paul Law, P-A-W-L-A-W. Uh, you should be able to see that on your screen. If you're watching us on your computer, you should also be getting an invite to join the Pigeonhole app on your screen. Or you could go into the chat function in the webinar and click on the link that is provided there. Once you're in the app, uh, you will see that you are able to interact to a certain extent with the other users. You will be able to upvote the questions that you like and once answered. The most popular questions will be raised for my attention. Uh, but please, you know, be civil, no rough play, no horsing around. So under Singapore law, Owning a pet means that you are in charge of that animal. And this applies not just to those of you who have paid for the animal or who have signed its adoption papers. As long as the animal is in your possession, custody or control, or under your care or supervision, you are the person in charge of that animal. So what does this mean for you? Owning a pet comes with many responsibilities some ethical, some legal, and many shades of both. So the purpose of tonight's webinar is to acquaint you with some of the responsibilities and rights that you have as a pet owner in Singapore. We'll cover the following topics. First, before getting a pet, what are some things you need to think about before you get a pet? Where do you live? What type of animal are you thinking of getting? Secondly, when you get a pet, what are some of the administrative requirements that you come under? Do you need to license your animal? Uh, what about microchipping or obedience training? And what about day-to-day? -day? Must you clean up after your pet uh, in public? Are you allowed to uh, wash your pet anywhere you like, public? And of course, we'll cover the basic care requirements as well. And thirdly, we'll cover special situations. For example, you know, what happens if your pet is attacked or becomes injured? What if you become unable to continue taking care of your animal? Can you sell your pet? Can you release it into the wild? What if you get a divorce? Who keeps the animal? And what if you discover that a pet is being neglected or abused? What can you do? What must you do? So to discuss these issues, uh, we are joined tonight by two very special guests, Miss Abigail Tan and Miss Sat Narai. Abigail is a senior corporate counsel at Elastic, a tech company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. She is also a key member of Elastic's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives for Asia Pacific and Japan. Outside of work, she is engaged in animal rights and DEI initiatives, and also pro bono work. Abigail is a proud mother to a very famous six-year-old corgi, Bruno. Satna is the Deputy Director of Representation at Pro Bono SG. After being called to the bar in 2013, she began her legal career at Drew & Napier before joining the inaugural batch of the Class Fellowship Program as the sixth Class Fellow in June 2015. She was offered the role of Class Advocate just two years later in 2017. In her five years at class, she has appeared before both the Supreme Court and the State Courts, 
and has secured acquittals and successful appeals for her clients. For her exceptional work, she was commended by the SAL Selection Committee for the Joe Grimberg Outstanding Young Advocate Award. Outside of work, Satna is a committee member of the SPCA. And she has had 10 dogs, five cats, countless birds, fish, frogs, and turtles. And she says she continues to live in chaos while remaining obsessed with all of her pets in equal measure. Abigail, Satna, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. A virtual round of applause for you. <laughs> you need to stop that. <laughs> You're taking all our jokes. <laughs> all right. So the first uh, area before getting a pet, uh, Satna, what are some things that you have to think about before getting a pet? Sure. So um, I love the introduction you gave, uh, Joanne, is where you talked about um, what it means to be a pet owner. Um, of course, the title of this webinar is Pause and Us, but obviously pets range with, uh, you know, come uh, across a variety of species and ranges. They're not just paws, they are webbed feet, they are wings, um, and they're also pets with no, no feet, you know. And so the, the fundamental questions we ask ourselves, um, as I suppose when we talk about the law, is what is a pet owner? What are pets? And what are pets that you cannot keep? So... Um, the first question, what is a pet owner? You're absolutely right. You don't really have to purchase a pet to be a pet owner. Um, you can adopt, you can find a pet off the street, you know, you can um, go to a shelter, pick up a pet, you can import a pet, you can buy a pet. And so the question is, what then defines a pet owner if you have so many ways of acquiring a pet? And so the definition really is anyone who is in charge of any animal or bird for the time being. So in that moment, assuming you've found a pet and you've been taking care of it for approximately two to three years, you could very well be defined as the pet owner. And, and then it, if you peel that back a little bit, you ask yourself, what does in charge mean? And the legal definition is anybody who has custody or control, or if the animal is under that person's supervision or care. And then if you peel that back a little bit more, what does that mean? if an individual has the animal in the course of the individual's employment, for example. If I'm, for example, a pet farm owner, am I considered to be a pet owner? By this legal definition, I would say we, you would be considered a pet owner. And then the next question is, then what is a pet? Pets are any animals or birds. Um, and by animals, it's been defined as, you know, either a beast, a bird, a fish, a reptile. The question is, why do we have such a wide definition of pet? The reality is, you know, living things come in all different shapes and sizes. And the fact is, we can take any type of creature into our house, legally or, or illegally, that's, that's a different question. But we all have a responsibility in ensuring that the animal that we take in is well kept. And that's the purpose of the laws and the definition of the laws. We keep the definition wide so that we allow the laws that protect the animal, that ensure the welfare of the animal, the laws extend to all types of animals as wide as possible. So for example, an abuse of a mouse, for example, is also considered abuse. Um, of a rabbit, abandonment of a rabbit is as harsh uh, an offense as abandonment of a dog because the laws protect all pets equally. So to answer your question, it bears what, what you need to bear in mind is any animal you bring into your home deserves the same amount of protection um, from abuse and deserves the same amount of care that you would afford what you would term a domesticated animal. So for example, even lovebirds, when they fall sick, you need to bring them to an avian vet. It is part of your responsibility as a pet owner because they, are, they do fall within the definition of a pet. There are certain animals you cannot keep and those are wildlife basically unless you have special permission um, and a certificate generally from uh, a CITES certificate that allows you to keep certain types of animals so for example you're talking about Malayan box turtles American bullfrogs I mean let's just stick to the Singapore frogs they are equally cute you know but the point is for these special types of animals you need uh, because they are endangered, because they are wildlife, and there are certain implications on our ecosystem if we don't take care of them properly, you do need permission to bring them in and to keep them. Those, that's my very long answer to your very short question. No, I mean, that's very interesting. So actually what I gather from what you're saying is there are laws that permit 
the keeping of certain animals as pets, but that is a separate question from whether the animal in your care and control is being kept well. Yes. So if you if you grab some wildlife off the street and you're not allowed to keep it as a pet, you still fall under the legal obligation to ensure the minimum care and responsibilities towards that yes. animal. Yes. That's very interesting. Um, what about for people who may live in public housing versus, for example, private housing? Right. Are there specific uh, regulations that people in public housing should be aware of? Yes, I'll, I'll answer this very quickly and then I'll, I'll hand over to, to Abigail as well. So um, for pets in HDB, um, pet owners can keep one dog from a list of approved breeds and there are about 48 breeds and these are mostly terriers. I think because of the size of the terrier and their disposition. And if you do keep more than one dog, um, you do need special permission um, or you could be fined up to $4,000 and the pet could be removed from your house. We are also looking at a shift in the general policy um, away from terriers and smaller dogs into me medium-sized Singapore specials. So you're looking at uh, Project Adore, right? Um, and also Project Adore Canine, which now allows working dogs to be adopted into households. I think that's an amazing move towards opening up our hearts and homes to medium-sized dogs who probably, you know, you cannot assume the disposition of the dog just because they're slightly bigger doesn't mean that they can't be lovable and friendly and, yeah. you know, well-trained. Some small dogs are t terrorists. I, I well, <laughs> I, I used to have a small dog, so I shan't comment. But I think the idea also is to ensure proper training for these dogs who are coming into the HDB flats because we live so close to each other. Yeah. You know, um, dogs do tend to bark. You know, they, they, they do tend to make noise. If they defecate or... Uh, urinate on, along the corridors, it can pose to be a nuisance. So some amount of training for the dogs uh, would be required. And I think close oversight as to how these dogs are integrated into the ecosystem. When we talk about private housings, it's a bit it's a bit different for, for, for um, non-HDB and commercial premises. You are allowed to keep up to three dogs. Um, and these are dogs from unscheduled dog breeds or scheduled breeds. Um, in the schedule, I, I won't go so much into the, the, yeah. the nitty-gritty details, but there are dogs within the schedule, such as bull terriers, Doberman, Rottweilers, where you will need additional conditions and permissions in order to keep them. For example, your dog needs to be leashed and muzzled in public. You, they need to be microchipped. You need to take up an insurance policy for at least $100,000 coverage against damage to property or persons. You must take up a banker's guarantee of up to $2,000 or $5,000, depending on the breed. And the dog must go through obedience training. It's not easy to keep must. these types of big dogs. It, they must, and there must be a certificate to show they've completed the training by an accredited trainer. So keeping of such big dogs in private property, actually, it's not easy. And it's a significant financial undertaking precisely because of the strength and the, the size of the dog. This is not to say their dispositions can be assumed either yeah. because I've seen extremely lovable uh, uh, Rottweilers and German Shepherds. But I think the point is just to assure the public that you know the dog is well-trained and steps are being taken to care for the dog. For those who want to know what type of dogs that they can um, look at uh, when they are you know trying to, 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 to see which dogs they should get under HDB and under unscheduled breeds, you can look at the Animal and Birds Act. You can look at the code on animal welfare as well and also the NPARC's website tends to be an amazing resource um, in, 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 an, in finding out more about what your responsibilities are and what types of dogs you can adopt. Cool and I know uh, Abigail you have an interesting story about keeping a certain type of dog in a public house. You want to share that with the audience? Yes, thanks Johannes. So uh, to Sana's point, uh, some medium type of some medium breeds can also be kept in public housing. For example, Bruno, my my corgi, we used to keep him in HDB as well. You just have to apply for a license with ABS and you need to get your dog certified with a trainer. So obedience training is one thing. We have to get from a certified trainer that is listed on AVS website. So AVS and PUPS have a has a list of certified dog trainers. As long as you get a certificate, the obedience training is done and you maintain that for the period of time during which your dog is being kept in the public housing. And that and for private housing, uh, legally it's for three dogs only, but 
on certain case by case basis, you can apply to AVS to ask for an exception. Mm -hmm. So I do know people who have applied and have gotten permission to get, say, another another dog mm -hmm. for whatever reasons. As long as you can show that you will take good care and control as over your dog during a period of time, and that you the dog has undergone relevant obedience training. Cool. So I mean, there is a question from the audience now that is right on point with this that we're discussing. Do you are you able to say what are some of the reasons that HDB looks favorably favorably upon when someone asks for an exemption to keep, for example, a corgi in a public house? Yes. So they were asked that um, who's taking care of the dog? What is your routine um, um, for taking care of the dog when you're at home? What sort of training session has your dog undergone relevant obedience training? And who is the trainer? Has your trainer certified that your dog will be taken care of? You have to also guarantee that your dog will be properly leashed and and uh taken and looked after. And if your dog pees in a public place, you will wash it down with a water bottle or pick up the poo accordingly. I so see. you just have to mention you have to ensure and convince uh, HDB that you will take proper care mm -hmm. of your dog. Oh, actually, this really puts me in mind, uh, Sat, of your story that you shared of your father when uh, he got a dog uh, in your old place and what he would do with the neighbours. I mean, would you like to share that? So my, my, my dad is a very fierce looking man, but what he tends to do is he tends to walk around the neighbourhood and, you know, talk to all the neighbours and smile and make friends and, you know, introduce our dogs to them and say, well, look, this is my dog. And, you know, he's so friendly. Look at him. And over time, I think the neighbours formed a very close uh, bond or affinity with the dogs because they would recognize us from a mile away when we were walking and my dad became known as the dog father because he, <laughs> every day he would just be roaming around with our dogs and you know it's, it's just sitting outside introducing the dogs to them as well making them feel comfortable and I think the key to this is recognizing that look we live in Singapore it's land scarce you are not going to get away with having a terrible relationship with a, a neighbor and or having a badly behaved dog. Um, if you have a dog that, for example, has abandonment issues and if you leave the house, the dog is wailing all day, you will get complaints. And so it's important to, as what Abigail said, to identify these issues, to treat them early, um, get a trainer or, or, or find a way to... Um, converse with your dog you know um, just ensure that your dog is trained well um, in that it doesn't cause an inconvenience to your neighbors understanding what um, works for your neighbors is also important because at the end of the day we all have to stay together and your neighbors can complain and if it does pose a nuisance you can be found guilty of an offense as well your dog may be removed as well. So it's important, um, well, not just dog, actually, all sorts of, yeah. of, of animals can, can pose a nuisance. I, I, I recall a friend telling me she had a parrot that would, oh, yeah. would you know, speak like a human almost scarily <laughs> and, and, and it, it started posing a problem yeah. for the neighbours because her dog, her a parrot was in the balcony right beside her neighbor's balcony so the neighbor used to get scared in the middle of the night when the parents started talking Obviously. and so it, it 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 caused her a lot of uh, uh, concern you know and so there were certain arrangements that she had to make to make sure that you know in the night the parrots re realize that it's at night and yeah. you know we need to pipe down a little bit so some changes will have to be made in order to um, accommodate the situation so what i'm hearing is there are the rules which kind of set out a minimum floor of requirements that you have to meet. But beyond that, I mean, it really is just common sense, good behavior, good civic mindedness, good neighborliness, right? Yes. And maybe if I could just jump in to add as well, in the event of issues, which we will discuss a bit later, the courts do tend to want parties to go through mediation. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, before we go, before yeah. we go to court and actually fight things out and send nasty letters to each other, which trust me, no lawyer enjoys sending out contrary to popular belief. So the first part of call generally tends to be mediation, which is in essence what you have to do anyway. You have to talk things out. You have to find a good way to, you know, sort, sort out any issues that may arise. So why not do that from the start? Right. Okay, well, I mean, so now I've, gotten a pet, okay, I've done the homework and I've decided on the animal I want and now I have an animal with me at home. Um, Abigail, what are some of the things that I need to think about as a newly minted pet owner? 
Well, it depends on what sort of pet you've gotten. So if you have gotten a dog, you would need to get your dog registered and licensed and uh, microchip as well. Although this is not recommended, as in it's not legal uh, for other breeds, it's not a legal requirement for other breeds, but it's also recommended for other types of animals. Like you can also microchip your pet birds. Can you? You can, oh, you can do so. That. So it's actually a good thing for people to do that because if your animal, your pet goes missing, the microchip has a unique identifier and you can go and you uh, someone picks up the, the animal on the street, you bring the animal to the vet, the vet can then work with AVS to download the relevant personal information and contact you so you can then find your lost pet. So under Singapore law from uh, September 2020 onwards, if your dog has been sterilized, there is a one-time fee I think it's like $15 or so. And your three-year fee uh, for, like, for sterilized dog can then be converted into a one-off license. But if your dog is not sterilized, you have to pay it uh, continuously on an annualized basis, which is a lot more. I think I pay about like $90 for, for Bruno. Bruno's. Yes. I see. So that's microchipping. That's licensing. That's licensing. Yes. I, see. I think it's $35 per sterilized dog for the yes. first three dogs. Yes. When you go to the fourth dog, that's a steep increase yep. uh, of the amount. Yeah. Okay, I see. Okay, so besides, um, you know, licensing and microchipping, uh, Satna earlier mentioned, you know, some requirements for obedience training. Do you have any uh, experience with that, Abby? Yes, uh, definitely. So when you, when you get a pet, you definitely have to, it's recommended to bring your pet for an obedience training so that you know your, uh, your pet can then live harmoniously with your neighbor. When you bring your dog out for a walk along the parks, your dog don't go out to someone else and start attacking them or tugging on you. And it's not very good neighborliness behavior as well. And on top of that, it's apart from obedience training, you also need to have minimum standards of care when you're looking after your animal, making sure that they have proper uh, fresh water, access to fresh water, proper nutrition, and a well-ventilated place to live in. You can't just put your pet in a cage and leave it there for 24 hours or maybe 10 hours at a go when you're at work. There needs to be a well-ventilated area. And this, and according to the, there's an animal code of conduct for pet owners and they do set up the minimum requirements for different type of breeds. For example, whether you're a cat owner, dog owner, they also have one for birds, hamsters, guinea pigs, and rabbits. So depending on your breed, go and look at the code of conduct and see what are the minimum requirements that you have to adhere to. Oh, so I'm actually I'm interested in this this uh, obedience training thing. So for example, if my my uncle, uh, you know, watches YouTube all day and he thinks you know he's really good with dogs, and I send my newly acquired dog to my uncle who trains the dog, and I think the dog is quite well behaved. Does that count? Oh. Well, I mean, if your uncle eventually gets a certified, uh, becomes certified as a dog trainer, that might count. But generally speaking, we would recommend that you go to a certified dog trainer. Okay. So you can go into AVS for a list of trainers okay. that they have. Um, we also recommend that you look for a trainer that uh, emphasizes on cruelty-free training because not all trainers adhere to the same type of training process. Okay. That's cool. So that's training your dog. And actually, you know, I mean, as a lawyer who does a little bit of a crime practice, uh, I thought it was interesting for the audience to know that, you know, it actually is an offense if your dog is in the habit of running at persons or vehicles or bicycles passing along a public road. And it's not an offense for the dog. It's an offense for you as the owner. And you can be punishable with a fine of up to $1,000. So yeah, did you know that? I should do not. <laughs> okay, so, um, what about um, what if you witness an act of cruelty? Let's say you know you have a dog, and you get to know other pet owners, and then you suspect that someone else's animal, not just a dog, or you know, someone else's animal, is not being uh kept to a minimum standard of care. What are some things you must do? What are some things you can do? Any of you? I think before we go to seeing someone else commit acts of cruelty on a dog, the law in all of the statutes and subsidiary legislation, basically in the acts and in the rules, draws a distinction between taking care of a pet responsibly, which could amount to an offence if you don't do it, and acts of abuse. 
And I think that that distinction is important to highlight. When I say taking care of a pet responsibly, I mean it could also be problematic if you don't feed your pet regular nutritious meals, for example, if you're constantly giving your pet just plain rice or not feeding them for two to three days. If you provide your pet with an unsuitable housing, you lock them up in the balcony, for example, you don't groom your pet well, they are matted, they're uncomfortable, their teeth are rotting. You, you don't bring your pet to the vet, for example, for, for regular you know, um, checkups and when it shows signs of illnesses. You don't sterilize your pet. Your pet is just constantly giving birth to litters of puppies, cats, whatever. That in and of itself can form an offense because it's irresponsible pet ownership. That doesn't border on abuse. It's very different from an act of abuse, but it still can amount to an issue that pet owners could run into problems with. So it's very important to be mindful that at the first level, the question is how do you care for a pet responsibly? And if you can't, does that amount to an offence? The answer is yes, it could potentially. On the second level, then, we then ask ourselves, what is an abuse, right? Um, abuse is defined under Section 42 of the ABA as um, where someone cruelly beats, kicks, ill-treats, overrides, overdrives, overloads, tortures, infuriates, or terrifies any animal. And the offence is punishable by a fine of 15k and 18 months or 40k and uh, two years if it's a commercial entity jail. that's uh yes and two years jail sorry if it's a commercial entity so the, there is a distinction there and i think abuse then borders into actually inflicting terror mm. and fear on the the animal um and for that that is considered to be quite a, a serious offense it is also an offense for you to not make reasonable efforts to not find a dog that is missing. Really? Yes. Oh. And that, I mean, I would say it's part of animal cruelty where your pet goes missing and then you just kind of, oh, okay, mm. you're on your own on the highways, you know. Conveniently, you know, I can't yeah. find my dog. Yeah. So it, that, 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 that's an offense as well. You can be fined up to $10,000 or imprisoned up to 12 months. So it's not, it's not um, uh, uh, you know, so easy to say, this is this is animal cruelty, this is not. There are clear cases of animal cruelty where you inflict harm, but not doing something could also amount to animal cruelty. Confining them in small spaces, leaving them out in the rain, for example, that could also amount to animal cruelty. So if you take a step back and you look at it, what is the principle that underpins all of these rules and laws? It's really not to cause pets unnecessary suffering and to take active steps to protect them, to take care of them. My, the good people at Animal Infirmary, my vets know every single thing. I just pick up the phone and I call and I ask them, what's going on? I need to bring my dog in. And it's, it's almost, I mean, God bless their souls. I've been like stalking them. And, and you know, it, every fur parent who is in yes. love with their child has experienced this anxiety and fear. And I encourage that. I encourage that because your pets can't speak. Yep. They can't tell you what's wrong. It's only the doctors, the ma magical hands of the doctors that when they touch them and they they feel them and they know that they are in discomfort and they do the necessary tests, that's when you're able to, you know, identify what's hurting your dog. And that's the best act of empathy, you know. So it takes away from the acts of, of, of cruelty, which is you leave your dog in pain and let them sort out their, their issues. That's not how it works. And so to go back to your question, what do you do when you see these acts of cruelty? The mm. first thing to do is really to report. Report yeah. it. SPCA, um, and I may be biased, but they have one of the best uh, responses, you know, uh, the response teams to such acts of complaints, you know, and recently someone reported that a dog was missing and they were there within two hours and they were able to come and pick up the dog and they were able to locate the owner. I mean, the response responses that you get from um, some of the emergency response teams uh, tend to be fantastic. So the first thing to do is to raise the alarm bells. You can also report it. It can also be made into a police report and the necessary action can be taken. There are so many statutes that cover animal cruelty yeah. um, and that also is an offence. I've personally dealt with one case as a criminal defence lawyer where my client um, had abandoned his sick dog at the void deck. Um, he had tried to treat it at home. He didn't have the resources to bring the dog to a vet um, and he tried to treat the dog at home and the dog... Uh, obviously didn't make it and you know he when the dog was at its weakest he brought the dog to the void deck and hoped to god that someone would bring the dog to a vet unfortunately the dog passed on and so he was charged it's an offense 
it's abandonment of a sick animal mm. you know so um obviously the 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 ramifications there are fines jail terms even especially the seriousness of the offense the dog was unwell for a significant period of time so if you take a step back and you look at it what's the best first step the first step is really to ring the alarm bells call spca make a police report raise the alarm bells. Actually, if I may just interject there, that's a very good point. I think the distinctions that we have to make is between neglect and abuse. For abuse, yes, we should definitely raise the alarm bell. But when it comes to neglect, that's a very grey area. And how we pack ourselves as being able to take good care of our dogs or our pets might not necessarily be what other people may think so. So instead of in those situations when it's more grey, I would actually recommend that you talk to the pet owner first to ask them, are there any issues that is that is affecting you affecting your ability to actually look after your pet responsibly so before we 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 jump to conclusions maybe it's just for a uh, certain period of time or maybe they're just not aware of how to take care of their animals so introducing them to proper trainers proper uh and teaching them how to look after their pets nutrition proper nutrition meals and introducing them to a vet that might actually help them. You can guide them along. I think to Sana's point earlier on uh, having good neighborliness, that is also one of those key things, to have empathy towards other dog owners or other pet owners. So in my instance, I actually monitor Bruno's poop. So I take photos of Bruno's poop every time he goes okay. so that I know exactly when he is not doing well. So then I can track his health. That's what we do anyway for human babies. And our dogs were, and our pets will never grow old. I mean, they grow old in that sense, but they can never ever talk to us. So we have to take it on us to look after them and to have the initiative to do so. And maybe we can also then educate other people and other pet owners, which is exactly the reason for this whole webinar in the first place. All right. So you heard it from Abby. Take photos of your dog's poop <laughs> religiously. So, I mean, obviously, we've now tumbled into the last area that we were supposed to talk about, which was special situations. So we've covered, you know, what do we see animal abuse? Um, but Sat, you raised something in your reply that I found quite interesting. So what if somebody, you know, loves an animal, but is for various circumstances no longer able to take care of that animal? I know uh, the example that you raised, that's something not to do. Don't abandon your animal. Yes. But can you, for example offer it up for sale? I, I'm so happy to answer that question. Um, I work at the pro bono office and so I've seen my clients, you know, struggle with day-to-day, -day, you know, finances. They're unable to afford sometimes food on the table, but some of them treat their dogs like children and they give them everything, you know, but unfortunately circumstances just give rise to you know a situation where they may not be financially able to care for that dog that dog and it takes a lot of courage and strength to admit that and to say this dog deserves to be in a better place um and sometimes love really just isn't enough you know um so the first part of call i would say is really to um Explore your options. See if there's anyone, a family member who can assist you in adopting the dog. You can't sell your dog. In order to sell a dog in Singapore, you need a license. Mm. And so you can't sell it. Um, but you can give your dog up for adoption with minimal adoption fees. If you impose adoption fees that are too high, the court is going to look behind that and see what you're actually trying to do, which is sell your dog. Yeah. And so you're not allowed to do that. Okay. The other option, I thought it would be good to raise because again, the the, the good people at SBC have been doing a fantastic job in addressing these types of issues. They have launched a series of free um, health screenings for pets across Singapore. And it's intended to help about a thousand pets. And of course, it's a very basic health screening. It doesn't replace going to a vet for more serious ailments. But for some very basic things where you can do a very simple test or you know, just check on the teeth, for example, there are these options available out there now. Um, and they are exploring to see how this can be expanded. So I think that's a very a step in the right direction. And I think as that as we explore that um, and that grows in terms of the initiative, more people should be able to get access to better healthcare for their pets. Okay, so under all of that, you're not allowed to sell your dog without a license. What if it's, for example, um, a cat that you may have uh, adopted as you know one of the community cats and then you're no longer able to care for that cat? Would putting that cat back where you found it, would that be considered abandonment? Um, so you found a community cat? Well, yeah, for example. Yeah. yeah. So well, generally, you shouldn't, you should try to 
called the Cat Welfare Society or one of those like SPCA as well to try to find the cat a better home instead of just letting the cat go back out into the world. Well, in that instance, I think it goes back to the question of what is a pet owner. And in that instance, as Satna mentioned, you, you, when the cat is under your control, you become a pet owner. So when you take over the cat and you put it back and then you can't actually then abandon the cat. Mm. So it will be good to actually reach out to the animal welfare groups or ask your neighbor and ask anyone in the community. We have like Facebook groups, WhatsApp, Telegram groups for all these animals anyway. So you can just ask someone, can you help me to take care of this cat? I see. Hey, but can I just jump in very quickly? If you stay in a HDB, you have no business taking in a cat, by the way. It's illegal. Um, I, 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 and I hate to say that because I, I, I am a cat lady at heart. I used to think I was a dog person, but then I got a cat and I'm, I, I think I've, I've converted. Um, and I think the difficulty with keeping cats in, in HDB is also that it's a high rise um, situation. Cats tend to be very curious and they're really fast. You know, they may jump out if you don't have the necessary precautions. There is a move to keeping to opening up um, and keeping cats in HDB. I think this was a project um, that I was think it's undertaken in Chongpang, right? In, in the, Chongpang, in the correct. Sambawang GRC, okay. they actually do allow. They have an initiative to allow cats in public housing. It's called Love Cats, if yes. I'm not wrong. Yeah. And I, I, I'm fully supportive of this because it ensures that those who want to keep cats take the necessary precautions in meshing up the the, the windows and ensuring the cat is safe. Cats are extremely loving creatures. I mean, and they can, they can they, just as endearing as dogs. Some people would argue more, but I, I have to be impartial to my cat and dog. But actually, to that point on mashing up the railings in high-rise building, you should also do that if you have a dog that you know tends to jump and try and, and you have a, um, in your balcony, you have a beanbag that your dog can use as a stepping stone to jump off. So I have invisi grills for my balcony so that Bruno does not jump off my building and commit suicide. Yes, aesthetically controversial, but yeah. I mean, good sense for your dog safety. All right? yes. I'm actually in that situation now. I'm trying to figure out, is there a way I can not put anything uh, at the windows? But I suppose pet safety should trump. So if you do take in a cat, if you're in a HDB, for example, that's the grey area, right? You see a cat that's yeah. injured on the street or community cat, and you think, let me take him and let me nurse him back to health. What do you then do after you've nursed this cat back to health? I think you're in a tough spot. Um, of course, do not um, just release the cat if the cat needs further medical attention and help. Um, as what Abigail said, it would be good to get in touch with one of the welfare societies and to see if they can take on the cat and have the cat rehomed uh, in, in a much more humane way. Okay, so and now we've talked about what happens if you are no longer able to care for your pet. But you're still around. What happens if you die before your pet? I know, Abby, you, you alluded to this earlier when you said our pets don't outgrow us because they mean they're forever in our care. They're forever reliant on us to take care of them. So, I mean, what happens if you, um, you know, touch wood, uh, pass away before your animal? I mean, what happens? Well, you can set up a will. So you can set up a trust fund such that all your earnings, your insurance, your uh, whatever you have will go straight to whoever the beneficiary is. And in a trust fund, you can name your dog as a beneficiary. So you have a, you have a trust fund manager who will then help you to manage the trust in the event of your unfortunate death and who will then pay out and look up to someone who will look after your dog or your cat uh, during that span of the time. And you can write up a will that, this is how your estate is going to be managed in the event of your death. And if anything were to happen to your pet after, uh, before your trust fund runs out, you can then decide, make provisions for it. It can then go to charity. You can have it donated to an animal charity of your choice as well, which is what I do for my dog. Cool. So um, what I'm hearing is, uh, although an animal is still considered legally property, you can draw, there are some instruments that you can come up with with your, with your trusts and wills lawyer to ensure that your animal gets the benefit of your estate when you pass away. Um, that's very interesting. I never knew that. Um, okay, so now another situation, okay? What happens if your animal is um, attacked or injured in an accident? Do, are there any cases that we know about um, that would give us some sort of guidance as to what we could do if we own that animal. Okay, I I, I will um, take that question and then I think, Abby, I think you you have some comments on uh, 
dogs being chattel, but I, I feel it's 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 one of those really weird situations where you look at a living a living breathing thing and you're like you're a property, you know, it's it's it it it's very unnerving. But I think there is no other way about it, and and I think the the case that I have, uh, what I thought it'd be good to bring up, is the case of Walker Helen Debra and Sopo Gyok. Um, it's a it's a rather unfortunate case. Um, the defendant had been driving her car. And she um, ran into uh, two domestic workers. They were walking two dogs. Um, unfortunately, one dog passed on and the other suffered serious uh, injuries to the hip. And so, um, of course, she was uh, criminally sanctioned. She was jailed for five days. She was banned for driving for 18 months. But I think she's probably never going to drive again, you know, because she's, I, I, I really think it would have been quite traumatizing as well for her. Um, but the, on the facts of this case, the court was faced with a number of issues. So the two dogs that were involved, one was a Tibetan Mastiff. So it was a rather rare breed of dog that had been flown into Singapore from Hong Kong. Um, and the second was a Labrador Retriever, a much more common breed, but she was quite badly injured uh, in the accident. And there was a vet report that depicted the injuries and showed that, you know, there's some lasting pain and, you know, is issues on the left hip, you know, so there was there was ongoing vet fees um, for incurred by the owners in treating the pet. And so the, the, the court had to ask two questions. How do we treat dogs? What are dogs? You know, and secondly, what are the damages that ought to be awarded for these two dogs? One that had died and the other that uh, was badly injured. And to answer the first question, what are dogs? Dogs are chattel. They're things, they're private property. And um, it therefore follows that damages are to be awarded on the basis that the dog is a property, just as how a car can be injured, a dog well, injured if you're damaged. If you're well, uh, I'm very passionate about my car, so I'm like it's a living thing. I got a name. Yes, do that right. I give her a name, you know. So if she's injured, I have to fix her, right? But yeah, damaged, right? And um, you also have uh, dogs, cats, birds that could be injured, and they are property. And how much would it take to fix them, right? And so um, the do the court then looked at how then, if we look at dogs as property, how do we of place of value on the dog and the dog then asked uh, well the, the court asked two questions do we look at the market value of the dog as it is now so for example this was a four-year-old tibetan mastiff it had already reached like one third of its life lifetime you know assuming it lives up to 12 year 12 years um, it's not a puppy anymore, you know, so do we look at the market value of the dog now, as opposed to the actual value of the dog, uh, according to the owners? So for example, I spent this much on the dog, this dog is, uh, you know, uh, has given me this much companionship, this dog is valued at this amount to me. And so the, the, the court had to confront the question of how to value the animal. In this case, interestingly, the owners didn't claim for any sort of emotional distress or trauma. Yeah, that's what I want to talk about because, I mean, that's the, the thing that, you know, most pet owners would immediately jump to, right? I mean, oh, my dog is hurt. I'm so traumatized. Yeah. So what is the court? I mean, uh, I mean, there was no, was there any discussion in that case about this or? So it's interesting because they didn't, they didn't go into that because the claim did, was not for this type of distress. Had the claim been about that, it would have been interesting to see how the court would have addressed it. Yeah. The other thing that the owners didn't claim for was the cost of replacing the dog, which could, would have been a legitimate claim. Um, so, for example, my Tibetan Mastiff has died. I want to fly in a new one. This is the cost of flying in a new Tibetan Mastiff. Can I claim for that? And it seems on the judgment that that would have been a valid claim had the owners wished to do that. But the owners didn't. And so the court simply had to address the question of what the market value of the dog was. Now, it is, it is a mathematical approach that I absolutely have no idea <laughs> how it's done because I am a lawyer and this is not my field. But um, the court approach it, to read out what the judge decided, the court applied the market value approach in quantifying the award for the dog. And this entails awarding damages based on the dog's pedigree, purchase price, general health, 
and unique traits prior to death or injury. Unique traits? Yes. So like oh. any markings, for example, that make oh, the dog see. unique. And as stated, um, well, as, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't make any other controversial claims. So the court only had to decide based on what it had in front of it, the physical uh, attributes of the dog, how much the market value was. And how it did that was it took the cost of a puppy of that breed, it minus the depreciation to derive the market value of the dog at the time of the accident. So for example, for dogs with half or more of their lifespan remaining at the time of the incident, the court applied a two-third depreciation discount to the market value of the puppy for that breed of the dog. So it's not a brand new car. For example, if your car has been on the market for six years, it depreciates. And so the value of the car goes down, similar to the dog. So for the dog that had died, for example, um, his name was Max. Um, he, he was around four years old when he was killed and he had more than half his lifespan remaining for a Tibetan Mastiff. And so the depreciation brought, brought, down, brought his value down to about $2,700 thereabouts. And so um, for the Labrador Retriever, on the other hand, it was, it was, it was much lower, but they managed to claim more um, for vet fees because the dog had to go to the vet and had to be treated. But interestingly, the court didn't allow the owners to claim for future fees. Um, so the owners then claim that, look, I after I treat this dog, I've given him, you know, the operation that 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 it needs. And in future, the, the dog will still need to be treated by the vets. And this is how much I estimate my potential cost to be. That was denied. That's very interesting. So that way of thinking about um injury or damage to an animal is kind of counterintuitive to what animal lovers would would feel because i mean i intuitively think that if i've been with an animal for longer its value to me is is more because in it, its loss to me is immeasurably more because i've gotten to know this animal i've loved it more and that is um uh, counter to the amount of time it has left on earth so that's very interesting this may infuriate you a little bit more but the um, owners were not allowed to claim for cremation costs as well of the dog that had passed on and we're talking about tibetan mastiff is 50 big, kilos yeah. and above right i would have had to hire someone to carry that dog and put him in the incinerator as well and so if you think about it um i i would have thought that i should be allowed you you've taken away something from me and you've you've made it so difficult for me and now i have to you know uh, you know put the well i have to sort of send my dog off and cremate him and you should be made responsible for that but i think the court found that given that death is part of the natural uh cause for a yep. dog you would have had to bear that amount I anyway yeah. that does not fall under damages that you mm. can claim yeah but so it's very Abigail. interesting when you guys are talking about how the court didn't take into consideration the emotional part of it and the value of the dog. Because if we look back on a previous case that was in court, the case of Sasha. Mm. So Sasha was a divorce case where uh, a couple had a dog and in the case of a divorce, how do they then split it? And like Satna mentioned, the dog was considered a chattel. So in the personal chattel, you can't then have care and custody and control. But Strangely enough, the court actually used similar questions when it comes to determining who should then own the dog, who should then own this chattel. And they actually look at the welfare of the dog. So it's quite a counterintuitive when you talk about it. A chattel actually have welfare. So they look at who would be better to take care of Sasha, who would who would have the better environment to be able to look after Sasha? Who was Sasha more attached to? So they actually place consideration on Sasha's well-being and what Sasha wanted at that point in time. So they look at all that and then they determine who would be the better so-called porn in that situation. Oh, no, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I think just to, to play devil's advocate a little bit, I, I think in this case, the court wasn't invited to consider the question of uh, emotional... Uh, damage or rather you know any sort of emotional compensation for for the trauma that was caused to the owners and I think had the um, case been pleaded differently it may very well it have could come have up been. they yeah. might have they might have done it so because I mean the courts are looking into getting uh, animals and looking at animals well-being yes. as well um, and maybe just also to round up because I think it's only good practice for lawyers to highlight that this case did go on appeal and uh, some part of the uh, appeal on behalf of Max, so the owner of Max appealed against the low amount. Some part of that was allowed, but I don't have the written judgment, so I can't confirm how much was allowed. 
But as it stands, this is the probably one of the few cases that goes into how dogs are treated and how damages are to be assessed. And to me, the biggest takeaway is this. The same principles that would apply to a, a thing, a property, a car, a house, for example, uh, you know, something that is of, that's valuable to you, the exact same principles would apply to a dog as well. Um, and we may see things differently because we are emotionally attached to it. But I think the courts take a very um, almost scientific approach. And I don't think that that's unfair and um, entirely unfair because even in cases involving injury to human beings, when we try and quantify what kind of damage arises out of that type of injury, we look at how long the person has left to live, what kind of education that person has, what kind of job that person would have been doing. We rarely even take into account emotional considerations, even in a human situation. Exactly. So much less a chattel. Yes. Interesting. So, I mean, we've talked about, you know, dealing with animals, well, the law's view of animals as property um, in the context of if somebody damages your property, what recourse do you have? We've also spoken about it in, in the context of a divorce. If there are assets, including animals, they need to be divided. How will those assets be divided? And there is a question here. How can I ensure that I get pet, full pet custody in the case of a divorce? Does anyone have any thoughts? Uh, well, you can consider uh, doing a prenuptial agreement or a private settlement. So, okay, prenuptial is one thing. So, before you get, before, yeah. before, so for, for everyone who don't really understand, so prenuptial is mainly before you get married, you decide that, you know, I'm going to sign this agreement in the event of my divorce, this is how we're going to split things. And that will include your personal property, the car, house, inheritance, and a pet if you get a pet. In situations where you don't have this kind of agreements in play, you can also consider a private settlement with your ex-spouse. So um, while the courts, it, instead of going to the courts and asking the courts to decide, and then it might not fall in your favor because it can also look into who paid for the dog, who, who is the dog licensed under, because as we talk about it at the start, you have to have a license for the dog. So the dog has to be registered to someone. And what if the dog's not registered to you? So then it's very hard for you to claim ownership over a property. So you can come into private settlements arrangement with your ex-spouse. You can say that, you know, I will, uh, in the divorce, I'll get my dog uh, three and a half days. You get the dog you know, three and a half days. When it comes to vet care and everything else, we will decide. It will be a cold mutual decisions that come about. And you can have this all written down as part of your divorce agreement. And it's being signed and, and uh, stamped in court. And so both parties have to abide by it. Yeah, and I suppose the other thing that comes immediately to mind is you just make sure that you can prove that you bought the animal. You paid fully for the animal, no? No, actually. Wow, interesting. Yeah. So I, I think this is the case of um, Tan Hui Kwan and Tan Kok Chai that Abigail was talking about, um, which involves Sasha. Yeah. So interesting that you remember the name of yes. the dog and then I'm just citing the yes. entire case. <laughs> Sorry, I only remember Sasha because Sasha was cute. Oh. So I mean, yeah, Sasha paid for every the, 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 the defendant paid for everything. So he paid for the adoption fee, the vet fee, the registration fee, but he didn't get Sasha. Really? So in that case, um, both the plaintiff and the defendants were in America um, and they adopted a dog there. And as Abigail mentioned, the defendant paid for the adoption fees. The defendant uh, was the one who um, signed the adop original adoption agreement as well. Um, and the adoption agreement was in his name. Um, interestingly, the plaintiff also signed the ad adoption agreement, but she didn't pay anything for the dog. Um, in terms of registration, the dog was registered to the defendant. The microchip was registered to the defendant. It was registered to his email address and telephone numbers as primary contact points. So it seems on paper that this dog belongs to the defendant yeah. because it's property. But then again, you see the, the, the softness in the law. Yes. You know, and I think that that's very important. You see the, the, the human aspect of the law coming in because the court then questioned, sure, you may have signed all of these documents. It's actually on paper, not really clear who owns the dog because it's, the, the plaintiff also had signed on some of these documents. You may have paid for adoption fees, vaccination fees, you may have given the official details for the adoption, but in order to determine who actually, whether there should be joint ownership of the dog, the court looked at the following factors, who had been taking care of the dog, who was closer or more attached to the dog, who the dog was more attached to, who would be better able to take care of the dog and to attend to all its needs, what the home environment was for the dog, 
and what it was going to be like and what should be done in the overall best interest of the dog. I feel like if you remove the word dog and you put the word child, this is a classic divorce case, yeah. right? Because yes. the court is precisely yeah. just determining. Yeah. So that's why I think when, that's why when we were discussing earlier, I mentioned that the court actually looked at care and control arrangement and they applied divorce proceedings and divorce factors and criteria when it comes to uh, our children, when it comes to a pet as well. So you can see that the courts will actually look into this situation so if you want to ensure that you get your dog, just settle it privately instead of going in. If you're not confident that, you're, that the court will ruin your favour. Just to round up the story, because people yeah. want to know what happened to Sasha. So in this case, because they, they, the, the plaintiff had relocated with Sasha to Singapore, yeah. um, and um, she was keeping Sasha in Singapore with her, the court found that there was really, it doesn't make sense to disrupt the present arrangements and relocate the dog back to the United States to be with the defendant who lived alone, worked long hours, and did not have the family support to look after the dog. Again, replace dog with child. Yeah. And it just sounds like the, the, there's yeah. an overwhelming concern for the yeah. well-being of the dog, which really, I mean, touched my heart just yeah. thinking about it. It's because, a good way that they're doing it. Exactly. You juxtapose yeah. both cases, yeah. you know, yeah. one of the dog, you know, dying and then treating it as yes. chattel and then the other of actually considering what's in the best interest yeah. of the dog. Yeah. And I feel like this, this case actually made me feel a little bit better. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's, some, there's a civil lining for animal lovers. I mean, it's not always chattel or property-related principles. There is, there appears to be some headway in treating uh, animals as sentient beings, uh, you know, capable of immeasurable value. Yes. That's cool. Okay, so um, other special situations. Um, let's say I don't own where I live. I'm a tenant. I, I rent. And I really, really want an animal. Can And my landlord is saying no. Is there anything I can do as a tenant? Well, I mean, you have to abide by the tenancy agreement. Okay. So... If your landlord is saying no, it's, it's kind of hard for you to then just bring in your dog or your pet illegally into it because that is a breach of a tenancy agreement. The ten, uh, tenancy agreements are very private matters and landlords can impose a lot of um, interesting arrangements. For example, they can tell you, I don't want you cooking certain type of food here because it will smell. So similarly, they can also say, I don't want you bring in a pet because maybe the fur would... would uh, affect the living area and they don't want it. So if you want to keep an animal, your only recourse as a renter is to ensure that you rent from a landlord who permit you yes. to keep an animal? Yes. Maybe just if I could add to that, I think you also still need to abide by the letter of the law regardless of what your tenancy agreement says. Of course. Yes, of course. So if you are renting a HDB flat and your tenancy agreement says you're allowed to keep the cutest civet cat in the world, I don't have any problems, I only should be allowed to come by and pet your civet cat once every three hours, that is still not allowed. because And, and you cannot use that as a defense in court to say, but my tenancy agreement said I could, yeah. right? So um, y y your tenancy agreement must comply with the letter of the law as well. So if you are staying in H an HDB flat, you may not still be allowed to keep a cat as well, even though your tenancy agreement either says nothing about it or allows it. Unless you're living in uh, Shun or... Yeah, oh, Chongpang area. Chongpang. Yes. Chongpang. All right. Okay, so um, I think those were most of the special situations. Maybe we just jump straight to the questions because they're coming in fast and furious. Nice. Um, okay, so one question. Will the legal definition of service animals broaden to include those serving persons with disabilities, uh, with invisible disabilities, for example, non-neurotypical children or youth? So I guess this question is about uh, the definition of service animals. There was a recent debate in Parliament when I think a nominated member of Parliament asked the question, when will the Ministry of Transport consider um, tr a pilot program to allow uh, emotional support animals on public transport? And I think the, the basic position is only train guide yes. dogs. So is there a distinction? What's the I distinction? think right now, uh, Singapore laws don't actually recognize emotional support dogs. I know in the US, we do allow that. And it's very easy to be quant uh, to be classified as an emotional support animal. And it doesn't have to be a dog. It can also be a snake, uh, uh, a rabbit, whatever it is. Falcon. Yeah, I've seen that as well. In Singapore, we don't. We only recognize guide dogs and mm. assistant dogs. So for instance, uh, if let's say you're visually impaired, or um, you need so you need a guide dog to help you. In those situations, you can you can uh, allow your dogs to go into public transport yep. and uh, go into restaurants, even where it says that no dogs are allowed. 
I see. So what if the 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 um, if I want to bring my pet into a mall? It's not a not a it's not a guide dog, but I want to bring my my animal into a mall. Can I do that? Well, generally speaking, um, that would depend on the mall regulations. Okay. In Singapore, by and large, most malls do not allow. Uh, pets in malls but there are some malls which have allowed certain situations and uh, they do allow you to bring your pets in but they probably would have to be in a carrier or or some other forms or in certain even if the mall allows you to bring your pet in there might not be every single shops so you you might not be able to bring your pet into every single shop you also have to then look at each individual shops but by and large the answer would be um no but you have to check each individual's mall's regulations i mean we had a conversation about this right Sat? and you said i mean even though you may be allowed to bring your animal in there's certain things that you have to think about nonetheless yes and they are like so I, I I do think there are some cultural considerations here yeah. because not everyone is comfortable, um, you know, with having a dog in the imme- their immediate vicinity. You know, I've I've I know people who are terrified of cats, for example, um, because they look at them and they think of like the exorcist or something like that. So there are people who are genuinely terrified just looking at an animal which we may find absolutely adorable. I think with dogs as well, very similar. Um, sometimes the smell of the dog can can be off-putting, especially if you're talking about going to a mall with, you know, uh, places to eat and you're going to the food court and your your dog is just in a, you know, it's so cute. It's in a pram. Look, it's like a baby, but it's not, you know. Um, and I think sometimes when you're eating your chicken rice and there's a fur that's just flying around, mm. people people get aggravated by that. It's 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 fairly um, um, common for people to not be comfortable with that, especially if they are not animal lovers. And so I think we 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 are in a very unique position. The climate in America, the the way people are, is just very different. Uh, and I don't know if we really want to swing to that extreme of boarding a flight with a falcon on your shoulder but I, I think on the other side on the flip side there are places that allow you to bring your dogs there are dog friendly cafes where you'll meet like-minded communities of people who will not have a problem with you having your your dog with you and I think those places are places which you can go to but if we're talking about communal areas um, I think it's important to bear in mind the sensitivities of, yeah, of, of, of different people yeah. who may um, not enjoy that experience yeah. as much. Okay, so I mean, in summary, if your animal is a trained guide dog, you can bring it anywhere you like, public transport, malls, all fine. Um, if it's not a trained service dog, then you can't and you have to abide by the rules of the, you know, the, the relevant place. And as to the question, will the definition of service animals be broadened to include more than just trained guide dogs? I suppose that's a question for parliament. Yes, so I mean, yes. that's a matter for you to take up democratically. It's a okay. matter for you to question your MPs on. Yeah, maybe you should write a petition to that. Not that we are suggesting you do it. I, I, I did have another scenario in mind. So, you know, sometimes I, I head out and uh, go to the cold, cold storage nearby and then I see people chain their dogs up outside the cold storage where they go shopping, you know. Um, and I was always very curious because the dogs uh, sometimes seem a bit in distress, right? Because they're alone outside. Or sometimes they just seem like they're just chilling outside and, you know, it's completely fine. And so I, I was always wondering if this is an offense in and of itself. And so I was looking into some of the, the yeah. statutes on this. And it does seem that your dog can be removed yeah. because it's a dog at large. Yes. <laughs> and so um, I, I, your dog can be seized, your dog can be impounded, yeah. or your dog can be destroyed. And I, when I heard that, I'm just in my mind, I'm just thinking I'll never leave my dog alone. <laughs> you know, outside. Also, that can also fall under the case of neglect that yes. we're talking about, especially if you're leaving your dog leash in a very hot environment. So I've seen people mm-hmm. do that as well. They go and have lunch in a hawker center and it's 12 noon, sun blazing hot. They leave their dogs outside, leash to the bicycle stand or something like that. That can also border on neglect and not treating your dog with proper care. And under the under the Singapore laws, you cannot have your dog treated so so uh, so tightly that they cannot move as well. Yes. So that is that you could be fined. And so the, the threshold really is your dog, if it's found on a leash and under control of the person, so you must be nearby so that the dog is under control, you're fine. Yep. But if your dog is just on a leash and you're nowhere near and it's not under your control, it may be difficult to argue that you're not guilty of an offense. And if we take it one step further. You leave your dog in a car. Oh yeah, obviously. Yeah, yes. and you can crack yes. the window down all you want. Yeah. 
I'm coming in there with, <laughs> with a bat and I'm breaking open your, your your car, you know, you know what I mean? So it, it, it can be very difficult to draw the line. So I think it's always better to err on the side of caution when you're bringing your dog out to make sure that you have adequate measures in place to care for your dog. And speaking of that, uh, following on from that, from the dog in the car situation, there was actually a case on that recently. A dog walker was supposed to walk two dogs and she was caught off guard. She was, uh, um, she had to handle certain things. She left two dogs in her car and the dogs died. And she was actually uh, charged for it. So it's actually an offence under the law to do so. Yeah. So, I mean, we're talking about what, you know, do's and don'ts with animals. So there's another question here. Um, it's referring to the AVS, uh, and that's the Animal and Veterinary Service Code of Animal Welfare. So the question is, how legally binding is that code? Well, maybe I can start. So, I mean, in terms of, um, as lawyers, you analyze things in terms of the hierarchy of law. So it's a code start. So it's not, it doesn't have the same level of force as an act of parliament. Okay, so there are three layers of the law, yes. right? Uh, and, and Johanna, you can totally just jump in because this is our playground, okay? The first layer are statutes. These are completely binding. They're laws that are created by parliament. Your examples yeah. of statutes are like your Animals and Birds Act, yep. Wildlife Act, Penal Code, Miscellaneous Offences um, Act, um, and then you have Control of Plants Act, Endangered Species Act. Every time you see the word act, be afraid, be very afraid. These are laws, they can be held against you, okay? The second layer is what we call subsidiary legislation. So um, to the acts, you will see sometimes rules that explain how the acts are to be implemented. Or regulations. Or regulations, correct. So rules and regulations basically telling you, okay, for this specific act, these are some specific things you need to look out for. So these rules are, for example, the Housing Development Board Animal Rules of 1989, which tell you what kind of animals you can keep, what you need to do when you keep an animal. Um, you also have um, other types of rules, things like international rules, CITES, for example, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. And these are integrated into our legal system because they have international application. Um, we've, we've signed on to these conventions. And so the rules there are seamlessly brought into our rules such that they are binding on everyone. So you have those layers. And then to implement those layers, you have what I call guiding forces. So your code of conduct. So the code is guiding force. Yes. Okay. And so if you're asking me, is it binding? Is it a law? Is a code a law? It is the explanatory notes to a law. It can tell you how to behave and how to conduct yourself, failing which you may be in contravention of the law. So that's how I would explain how the code has an impact on, on, on pet owners. Okay. So that's useful to know. So... I mean, I guess it goes back to the principle that we've been sort of emphasizing throughout the talk. Just because it's not binding law doesn't mean it's not commonsensical. It doesn't mean that you can get away with not um, following it. Right. So another question here, uh, and I forgive me if I'm, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this. Toxoplasma gondi is a parasite that can cause behavioral changes and major health problems in humans. Can co-tenants who catch it from a landlord's pet seek compensation? So this is a very specific question, but I mean, at, at its heart, I mean, once we strip away the relationship between a landlord and the tenant, this is really a question about if I catch a disease from someone else's animal or someone else's pet, um, what are my remedies? And do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I guess it goes down to, so if you're co-tenant, there's a duty of care to make sure that you don't pass a certain uh, illnesses to your to um to your neighbors, people around to your, you. People around you. Yeah. Let's take away from a pet situation. Yeah. Let's look at just a normal situation where I'm sick. And let's say uh, I know that I have a transmittable disease like COVID or whatever it is. And I have a duty on me to ensure that I don't pass these diseases to someone else. And I take the necessary precautions around it to safeguard, uh, to protect my neighbors around me. And as Satna mentioned earlier, this goes back down to the whole idea of neighborliness. And it also goes down to, if you know that your, your animal is sick and has a transmittable disease that can be passed to another animal or can be passed to a human, that is actually something that you should take into consideration. And it might actually be an offense under the law for you to 
for, for there to be a transmittable disease and you don't actually seek care for your dogs. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to geek out a little bit here. So when you talk about compensation, there are civil sort of remedies that you can take up to sue the person that you think has caused you that damage. But actually, this is a little known thing. Under the Miscellaneous Offences, Public Order and Nuisance Act, and this is an act, so this is what Saad was talking about earlier. It's the highest level of binding law. It is an offence for an owner whose dog causes injury to any person. And I would argue that if the dog gives me Toxoplasma gondi, it has caused me injury. And this is an offence that's punishable uh, with a fine of up to $5,000. So that's the punishment aspect of it. But this law also provides that you can get compensation assessed by the magistrate's court. But the compensation to the injured person or the person who catches Toxoplasma gondi is uh, maxed out at 2000 So there are various things that you can, um, levers that you can pull on to get uh, your compensation. Also, if I could just add on to that, when it comes to duty of care and compensation, even though it's kept out at that, it's also you have to look at uh, the causation and the possibility of, of possibility of it. Is it a direct damage to you? And is it foreseeable that if I were in this situation, I would I would get that doxo um, illness? I think the... If you go back to first principles for civil matters, the real test is that of remoteness of damage. Yep. Um, and, and that's that's what Abby has touched on as well, which is how likely is it that this would have happened? We're not talking about it as a possibility. There's a there's always a possibility that some sort of illness can arise. But the question is that of likelihood. Yep. Um, and if you're the type of owner or, you're, or, or you know, the person you're staying with is the type of owner that regularly goes to the vet, that does checkups, and that practices responsible pet ownership, then the question of remoteness um, you know, becomes clearer because yep. then it's actually quite unlikely for this to have happened. And therefore, you can't really peg or, or tag the damage to the um, tenant, co-tenant. So it, the question is that of remoteness. Um, it's not a question of whether it's even possible. It is a question of if, whether it's likely that this could have happened. And if you had take the, taken the necessary, necessary precautions, would this have prevented it from happening? Yeah. Which I think goes back to our point about uh, following the minimum standards and code of conduct. So even though the code is not uh, is not an act, if you had followed it, that might actually reduce the damages. That might actually reduce the likelihood of you passing this uh, the disease on because you would have brought your dog or your animal to the vet on a consistent and regular basis. Yes. Yeah. So let's let's just tweak this scenario a little bit. Okay. So now it's not a dog that has passed me a disease. It's now a, a, an animal of some sort that has attacked me. You know what are my recourses? So, I mean, I, I, I think that the principles that you've both laid out uh, in civil uh, liability would apply, remoteness, foreseeability. But I just wanted to, um, you know, tell everybody that under the Miscellaneous Offences Act, in a prosecution for, some, for an owner of a dog who causes injury to another person, it is actually by law not necessary for the prosecution to show that the owner had knowledge of a previous propensity of the dog to be vicious or even that the injury was attributable to the neglect by the owner. So it seems like a strict liability type of analysis when it comes to claiming under the Criminal Act. I just wanted to say, I mean, okay, we're talking about different instances of other types of pets as well, but I mean, in the specific instance of a dog, if your dog bites someone or something, don't be scared. You know, uh, it's a dog, right? Um, sometimes these things happen. And the first step is really to assess what the injuries are. Um, it's not always the case that the dog will then be taken away and then destroyed and then you'll never see a dog again, right? So it depends on, first of all, the medical report that has to be produced. If someone is alleging that your dog has bitten him or her or it, there has to be a medical report to produce to show what the damage is, what the injuries are. Then um, a report can be made and the um, authorized officer or police officer can direct that your dog be produced under the ABA right? Um, and you will have to produce your dog. And I think the, the, the most important test here is really, is your dog suffering from any illness that could give rise to a much more serious injury to the person who has been bitten or the thing that's been bitten. Um, and if you refuse to, to cooperate with that, your dog could be removed and then taken to, to, to quarantine. 
Um, and that doesn't mean that you'll never see your dog again. You, you, after the dog is assessed, after the dog is uh, reviewed, then there's a possibility for you to take back your dog. You know, you can take a dog, your dog may be impounded. You may pay a small amount to, 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 to get your dog back. And you will be required to comply with several rules, something like training, muzzling. You can look at the um, ABR, the rules under rule 8A. It tells you the list of things that could be required of you if your dog is involved in these types of incidents. So please don't be scared and, and, and react, you know, in fear and then, you know, take your dog, run away, give your dog away, that kind of thing. Take your time, just assess the situation, assess what the damage is. And more importantly, consider training your dog because you want to prevent something like that from happening again. I think it goes back down, underpins to what we've talking about, about the whole evening. Basically, if you had uh, done the proper care for your dog and gotten relevant obedience training, leash your dog when you're in public, make sure that you understand your dog's temperament and that you are responsible for your dog. You are you have the necessary uh, temperament as well to look after a dog of that breed. And it goes back down to neighborliness as well. If your if your dog bites someone, go up to that person, apologize, get, exchange contact details. We talk about chatter. Similar in situations where a car and a car accident, you don't then just drive off, right? You exchange details. You exchange. Uh, you 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 try to have compensation uh, remedies as well. So all these things will come and help you to prevent things from escalating even further. And if we talk about other animals, then things like, I mean, I know someone is very passionate about snakes and birds, and we talk about all these animals coming in. Snakes are not allowed to be kept, by the way, so let's just get that off the table. Um, and things like birds coming in to you know, inflict harm or damage, either by biting, or someone sticks their finger in the cage and then your bird's not happy. Uh, there are very few rules that actually govern uh, what type of uh, compensation you can get, but you would generally go via the civil route. Yeah. Um, and even cats as well. I think cats, I mean, cats have the, you know, they have the ability to cause far more damage than dogs sometimes can because they, they, they can be quite fast, right? Yeah. And so you would still be responsible for the type of injury and damage caused. But I think um, the rules don't quite address the removal of the cat and then treating of the cat. It really addresses, uh, I guess, in a, from a civil perspective, the type of compensation you would get based on the injury that you would have suffered. Very, very cool. Okay, now there's this question here that is a bit of a curveball, but I think it'll be fun. In 2015, an amendment to the New Zealand law was made to legally recognize animals as sentient beings. Is that possible in Singapore and how would that change how the court sees animals? I guess we can talk about this in the context of Sasha and, uh, yeah, and the sure. judgment and how, yeah, any, any I mean, thoughts? I mean, in the case of Sasha, we did see that the court did consider the, the uh, Sasha as a sentient being of sorts because the court did look at who would be better placed to take care of Sasha, who was Sasha more attached to. And in that situation, you can sort of interpret the court looking at it as a sentient being. But whether or not we will be moving to that extent is something uh, more for Parliament to decide as opposed to us considering whether we think it would be. I think I know who the sentient being was that asked that question because that sentient being and I have been having this discussion for a very, very long time. I see. And I think a lot of it turns on um, how Singapore views animals. We've come a very long way. I think um, when we first started out as a nation uh, when in land scarce Singapore, um, we struggled to strike a balance between having a utilitarian approach and then coming in with a little bit more compassion for animals or sentient beings, whatever we, sh we, we, sh we want to, to call them. They all, we are all sentient beings. So I guess animals uh, specifically. But over time, we see um, more steps being taken to really protect some of the wildlife and also some of the animals that, um, community animals um, that we see in our uh, uh, environment, living with us, surviving with us, you know. As we sort of take over more of their natural habitat, um, we also see the state making arrangements like, you know, that there's a very nice corridor, green corridor yes. over the BKE yes. that allows animals to cross very nicely. And we see how animals are actually using it. So we're trying to understand their natural behavior. We're trying to facilitate um, their access to their natural habitat in a, in a humane way. And I think that's a step in the right direction. 
I'm not sure if we will ever reach where New Zealand is at because New Zealand is in a, in a in a world of its own. It's a very different type of climate. It's a very different environment. People place a very different premium on the wildlife. You can't even, you know, bring a flower into New Zealand without getting stopped at customs and being made to empty everything out of your bag. So they're very, very uh, protective of their natural environment. I don't see that type of uh, approach here. I see our approach to be a bit different. Um, and I think over time, as more voices gather together, I think a lot of it is really about stepping up together as a community and letting, you know, pe the, well, pa parliament, the powers that be, the people who are our voices in parliament know that this is something that's important to us. And, and, and this is the direction we want to take our society, our community in. I think that is something that we can aspire towards in the next 10, 15 years. And I think uh, Sana makes a very good point about how Singapore has changed over time. I've been a dog owner since I was a child. And you, you do see it. Singapore is very land scarce. We have limited space. But the government is actually carving out space to have dog parks in very prime locations like Tiong Baru, for instance. There's a, there's a nice area which people can go and bring their dogs and run off leash. West Coast Park has a very huge area as well. And we see more and more uh, cafes and restaurants being given uh, licensing to allow animals to sit around the area. So we have pet-friendly cafes. We also have pet cafes in this regard. And look at us here right now. Law Society Pro Bono Services is doing its first ever pet webinar because we do see, uh, we do see a right a demand for this, and we do see a, a place in which we are moving towards educating people on animal rights so that we can all live together harmoniously. Yeah, I mean, okay. So this is my curveball response to the curveball question. I mean, what does sentience mean? It, the ability to feel or perceive things and. I guess one way of looking at this is our laws in Singapore have already recognized that animals are able to perceive and feel things, which is why we have laws against animal cruelty and animal abuse and animal neglect. But we don't have laws against handbag abuse or handbag you know, mm -hmm. neglect. So in a way, the laws recognize that animals are not just pure uh, property. And that's kind of what we've been straying into in the discussion uh, so far, whether it's in divorce or in a, in a situation where it causes hurt to someone. Animals occupy seem to occupy this uh, strange uh, middle ground between uh, property, but also recognize to uh, have feelings and be able to uh, sense things. Yes. So that's interesting. I mean, and that's uh, hope for, pro for progress, I suppose. Um, okay. Now, the top uh, rated question at the moment is about Sasha's case again. What is the rationale or principle behind the courts not allowing for future expenses apart from burial to be covered um, in the settlement. But I think the question is, it to be covered in the order. So that's the Max case that uh, we oh, were sorry, talking Max, about. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what is the rationale for not allowing uh, Fe burial and uh, cremation? Future expenses apart from burial. Future expenses apart from burial. In this, On the facts of this case, it was because the surviving dog uh, was about 12 years old at the time. Um, and so uh, the court... So envisioned that the dog was probably not going to live much longer. And so if you have estimated the future expenses, and this, the, I think the estimation was in the region of $40,000 because the family just, uh, it, it is a estimation of the total amount that would be involved um, in uh, caring for this dog. And so the family estimated that the dog would live much longer. Um, but I think on the facts of the case, the, the, the court looked at just the general guidelines for how long a Labrador retriever would, would, would live. Um, and it assumed that, uh, well, the, the total amount of about 40K was a bit odd to be allowing such a large claim when the actual claim amount was only in the region of about $10,000, including the value of the dog, um, the market value of the dog, and also the vet, the existing vet fees. So it was a bit perverse to allow like a fourfold increase in estimated vet costs uh, subsequently. And so the vet uh, disallowed that on that basis. Do I think that that's a, a, a fair? I don't know because I mean I've had I've had a Labrador Retriever live for up to 18, 19 years. A well a well fed and happy dog can go on for very long, um, and so I think was it fair? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, also, I think what was I I felt um, was particularly heart wrenching was because the dog continued to have um, issues as it as it as it continued to live after the incident, and so. 
the, the question I had was, should the um should there have been an appeal to push for compensation um for these additional years, you know, two to three years that the dog lived on for? Because the accident happened when the dog was 10, the case was heard when the dog was 12, and their expectation was the dog was not going to live any further. But if the dog had lived further, should there have been an ability for the owners to claw back some more money? You know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how that would work. Um, but I think on the circumstances, especially for the surviving dog, um, they managed to get all of the amount that they spent in terms of vet fees. And I thought that that was fair yeah. because it would have required significant fixing in terms of, you know, installing uh, drills and, uh, well, basically fixing the hip that was very badly damaged. And also the follow-up um, vet fees that that subsequently ensued. So for the two years that the dog was being followed up on and there were already vet fees incurred, that they were allowed to claim. In terms of the cremation and burial, which is the second part of the question, as I explained earlier, I think every pet owner, when they buy the dog, no one likes to think about this, but really you come in with the expectation that at some point, this is an unfortunate reality that you will have to face. And so it is, a, I would say, a given expense. It's a, spent cost. It's, a, it's a sunk cost in the sense that you will have to cremate your dog. And so um, the court viewed this as a, a, basically, it's a sunk cost that just came earlier, right? Um, instead of it happening eight, nine years down the road, it just happened when the dog was four. And so it's not something that um, you ought to be able to claim from the defendant. Cool. So, okay, another one. Possibly controversial, but let's tackle this head on. While it's good to know that we have laws in place, the general sentiment appears to be that the laws are not being actively enforced and or that the sentences are too low. What are the panel's views on this? Which daring do person will take this first? Well, I do think that um, I... I mean, they, they do enforce it. They do enforce it from time to time. And as to whether or not the, the offense, the penalties are too low, my personal view is that more can be done. But I think it goes back to the same questions of how, how do we as a society view animals and whether we place the relevant uh, priority on animals and how how precious are they and so while we are taking more and more steps into it and you do see it in the news these days we have the uh, the dog walker case we have the platinum dog uh, owners case we have the one where this guy had a poodle and he dragged him down like multiple flights of stairs governments the uh, police officers uh, authorities are enforcing these situations and we are also looking into neglect situations the issue of the the couple who had 19 corgis, for instance, people are looking into it. It is being enforced. Whether we can do more to increase the penalties is something that remains to be seen. And maybe you can um, consider writing about it. Yeah, I mean, that's how it works in any democracy, right? Yeah. I mean, not every law, not every policy will be to everybody's liking. It's kind of about like, you know, the Goldilocks effect, you know, yeah. not too hot, not too cold. You want it just right. And everyone has a different view on what that is. And I think in a democracy, then, you know, the only way to do it is you speak to the members of parliament and mm -hmm. see if there are ways that you can um, progress the issue. I want to say as, as a criminal defense lawyer, yeah. um, that we do have laws that impose quite I would say heavy punishment because your your jail terms can go all the way up to 12 months, 18 months. Your fines can go all the way up to $10,000, $20,000. So the laws are there. Sure, we can increase the upper limit and the sanctions, but sentencing is a very fact-specific exercise. The, judge, the judges will look at all of the facts and will decide um, on the basis of the facts, what is the type of sentence that ought to be imposed? And so it really is up to all the players within the, 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 the judicial system, you know, your judges, your prosecutors, your defense counsel, to really highlight the relevant factors um, in order to, you know, push for the sentence that is the most appropriate. Do I think the laws can be changed? Do I think we could take a very different, stricter approach towards animal cruelty? In some instances, I, I, I agree. I think that there is space and scope to have a serious discussion as to whether we need to start taking a far more stricter approach in certain cases of animal cruelty, really just because we want to send a message. The law is about sending a message. It's about deterring people from doing certain things. And if we feel the laws at this point, or if the community feels the law at this point, um, isn't sending that message, then there's the space there for us to grow. 
Yeah, I mean, it puts me in mind of that quote, you know, the society is truly measured by how it treats its weakest members. Yes. And, you know, in, in this case, it's, it's uh, children uh, and animals. So in a way, if we want to have a yardstick to measure how we as a society are doing, um, it's about how well we take care of um, beings who don't necessarily, um, who aren't necessarily able to um, speak up for themselves. Okay, that's cool. Um, I guess we have time for one last question. Um, I guess I will just roulette this. Okay, I'll just deal with this one very quickly. Is it an offense if I see a dog in distress in a car and I pry or smash open the window? Um, actually, Sat, you're the criminal lawyer. Why don't you take I this? I threatened to do this. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think strictly speaking, if there are extenuating circumstances, yeah. um, you can. Um, but of course, uh, uh, you know, do take reasonable efforts to uh, ensure that the owner is not just like bending over in the car such that you can't see him or, you know, just outside, you know, picking something up or loading something yeah. up in the car because then um, that could in fact <laughs> turn out to be an offence because you didn't take the necessary steps to ensure that, you know, that that was in fact an extenuating yeah. circumstance. So I think what, what you're alluding to perhaps is the idea of acting in good faith. And there is yes. a general exception in yes. the criminal law that exempts you from liability if you do something in good faith for the purpose of preventing harm to other person or other property. You know, it just reminds me of this really funny case that I did. Um, I'm, my client, I'm, I'm representing uh, the guy who got injured. My client was in the act of committing a robbery when a good Samaritan came by with a pole and started hitting him and broke his arm, wow. you know. And my client looked at me and was like, can I claim? I'm like, no, <laughs> that's an extenuating circumstance. And the Good Samaritan didn't get charged. So I think it, it, it could very well, the act could very well amount to be an offense. But as long as you there's there's justification in that in that very moment, I think you you're 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 safe. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean that brings us right to the end of our um uh webinar. But I'd like to, you know, give each of you a chance to wrap up. Maybe in a couple of sentences, um, what is your key, you know, takeaway that you want to leave the audiences with today? Um, I want to shout out to my dog, Cookie. I love you very much. But also, they are here for a limited amount of time. Um, it is your responsibility to make the best of it for them um, and for them to give you the most of their lives as well. They need to be happy. They need to be safe. They need to be well taken care of. It's never too much love for a dog or a cat or any animal that you're keeping, a bird, whatever it is. They feel it. Give them your all. Abby? Yeah, so um, likewise, I want to shout out to my dog, Bruno, who is probably doing a very long walk now because he goes on three walks a day. Uh, so I, I would like to say that um, I'm here before you guys, not as a lawyer, but as a fellow pet owner. And I would like for you guys to step up and be a... And, Take good care of your dog and or your cat or your and or or your bird or whatever it is. They they are sentient beings to me, and we have our responsibility to take care of them. They are like kids who never grow up, and they will never be able to tell us when they are hurt or when they are upset or anything. So we should, regardless of whether you meet them. I mean, there's minimal standards of the law. Yes, we should all abide by it. But we should also go above and beyond that. If you want to own a pet, step up to it and take responsibility for your dog or for your cat. And these and your animals give you unconditional love and they're here for such a short span of time. So return the favour. Love them as much as you can and, and treat them responsibility, responsibly. And... Be a good neighbor as well. If your neighbors are not pet owners, try to um, educate them on what your dog or your cat is about. Or if, they are, if, if that's not possible and you know that they are terrified of the animals, try and find ways to live together. Cool. So, I mean, with that, it just leaves me to thank uh, our speakers, Satna and Abigail. Thank you very much for your time, uh, your wisdom and your insights tonight. Thank you for all your jokes. Yeah. They've been amazing. <laughs> And for those of you watching at home, uh, thank you for spending the evening with us uh, and your very engaging questions. Um, we hope that you've come away from tonight with more knowledge than you had before. And for embarking on uh, this journey of becoming a more responsible pet owner, uh, we take our cats off to you. <laughs> on behalf of Pro Bono SG, uh, I'm Johannes. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you and good night.